microphone's on. Hello, everyone. Welcome to tonight's webinar, How to Help Your Child uh, During COVID. I will be your moderator tonight. My name is Tracy Weiner. I am a District 58 parent, and I have a freshman daughter at Downers Grove North and a seventh grade son at Herrick. Joining with us tonight is our District 58 superintendent, Dr. Kevin Russell, along with our special guest, Dr. Elizabeth Levy, a child and adolescent psychiatrist based out of Chicago. Tonight has been made possible through the fine folks at the Education Foundation of District 58. We are grateful for all the wonderful things the Education Foundation does in our community. And I'd like to take this time right now to introduce Janet Alec Pala, the president of the board of directors for the Ed Foundation. Janet, thanks for joining us. Are you, is your mic on? Um, My mic is on. <laughs> as we get started here this morning, could you just give a little summary about what the Education Foundation does and where parents can find out more information about your organization? Sure. Thanks, Tracy. Uh, good, e uh, good evening to everybody. Thanks for joining us. Again, my name is Janet Alakpala. I'm the president of the Education Foundation of Downers Grove District 58. We're excited to be part of this first webinar on the very important topic of how to help your child during COVID and to discuss ways we can help to maneuver through this unprecedented time. Um, I wanna share a little bit about the Education Foundation. We're a volunteer nonprofit organization that was founded to be an advocate of quality education and to, raise ne and to raise necessary funds for programs within our school district. Each year we're proud to host and support programs such as Sneak Preview, an open house program for incoming middle schoolers at O'Neill and Herrick Middle Schools, the Green Apple Awards, the Distinguished Service Awards, Select 58 Essay Awards and Teachers Grants. You might have even attended our signature events such as Oktoberfest in downtown Downers Grove and the Harlem Wizards basketball event. I'm proud to serve on this foundation with 17 other volunteer board members that devote their time and talent to help increase awareness about our organization, as well as to find ways to increase funding and to continue our current programs and to develop new ones to fit the needs of our growing and changing community. This webinar will be one of many programs that we want to continue, and we can't do this without your support. So let us know about other topics that you'd like for us to cover in this webinar series. Email us at 58foundation at gmail.com. I'll put that in the chat. And if you're be interested in becoming a board member, our foundation would love to have you. And we're always looking for new members to help further the mission of District 58. Also, um, for those of us that couldn't join us tonight, we'll also have this available on the District 58 YouTube channel, as well as the Education Foundation Facebook page. So thanks so much for joining us tonight and um, enjoy the discussion. Thank you. Thanks, Janet. Okay, so let's get started. At this time, we are very excited to introduce Dr. Elizabeth Levy, who will help us navigate and support our kids during these stressful times during COVID. Uh, tonight's focus is about children's social emotional needs and how to best support them during this time of uncertainty when nothing is normal and everything is always changing. So after a brief discussion, my co-pilot, Dr. Russell, and I will get right to your questions. We um, got a lot of questions ahead of time and you're able to, I think you could submit uh, questions in the chat as well. And we're just going to try to get through as many questions from you at home as possible. So Dr. Levy, if you wanted, you had wanted to start with a little bit of an introduction. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, that sounds great. So um, it's uh, great to, uh, to be here with everybody this evening. Um, just let you know um, a little bit about myself and my background before we get started. Um, I'm a, a child psychiatrist. I'm a clinician and a researcher at um, Harvard Medical School, um, and I also have a private practice um, here in Chicago. Um, I study how children and families respond to all kinds of stressful events and build strength and resilience. Um, I've done this with children in Liberia, with pregnant teenagers in Peru, um, families in the Mississippi Delta, and families here in Chicago. Um, I'm also the mother of a two-year-old and a five-year-old and wondering um, whether the Chicago schools will ever reopen. So I get it as a parent as well. Um, I want to thank everyone for being here tonight. I know that no time of day is easy right now, but uh, dinner time can be really tough. So thank you for joining us. And I hope this can be um, as useful as possible. Um, so people sent in some terrific um, questions. So we really want to um, spend this time responding to, um, to the questions that, that all of you have. Um, some of the topics that 
came up were related to managing anxiety, um, keeping kids engaged and motivated, um, setting limits and, and expectations um, with kids during this time. I'm happy to speak um, about these topics or um, others that are on your mind. Um, because if you're wondering about it, other parents probably are as well. Um, you know, and then one other thing I'll, I'll mention before we jump into it is, you know, there's just so much uncertainty right now about what's going to happen and, and what we should do. And so um, I think, you know, everyone wants a right answer, a perfect formula, you know, always. And I think especially when we're anxious. Um, and the reality is that, you know, there are so many unknowns. And so I think, um, you know, in, in the absence of certainty, you know, really trusting ourselves as parents, I think, is, is often, you know, the best thing that we can do um, for our kids, because we know our kids the best. And so um, really kind of trusting your gut about, you know, what's going on and what your kids need. I would say, don't be afraid to do that because nobody knows any better than you. Um, but, uh, yeah, so let's, let's go ahead and get started. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'm just gonna, we're gonna hit through as many as we possibly can. Um, the first one comes in from a parent at Herrick. How can middle schoolers make new friends and feel a sense of belonging and acceptance during COVID? And I will bookmark this a little bit, um, just so you know, Dr. Uh, Herrick Middle School is seventh and eighth grade. So for many, for, for the seventh grade class, at least, it's their first time in a middle school setting um, in a brand new building where they've not been at before and they've spent their last six years in another building with the same people. So just to give you a little background on that. So this is a new experience for seventh and eighth graders. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, there's, there's so much in that, right? And I think um, there, um, you know, it, with each, with age, age group of kids, right, there's a different um, set of challenges right now. And I think, you know, in the middle school age, like, <laughs> it's the same challenges that we have in any time, you know, that are, um, that, you know, are specific to those ages. And then, you know, I think there's just more anxiety about it, right. And of course, with middle school, there's all of the complicated social dynamics. Um, and so, you know, now there's just this added, this added complexity about, um, you know, not, not being together or not being together as much. Now the, the, all of the, all of these schools, including this school has been on a hybrid model the majority of the year. Is that right? Hybrid or a remote option. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Um, right. So, um, I mean, I think, you know, the, that, you know, in a lot of ways, this is going to, this is coming probably from your, <laughs> from your kids, either, you know, your kids have um, ideas about, you know, what they, um, what they want to be doing. And then you're in the position of having to decide, you know, is this safe? Is this okay? And so, I mean, I think, you know, what parents are having to do is to kind of figure out, what are the ground rules, you know, for our family? And, and that's within the context of, of the community, right, too. So like some, some school communities, you know, are setting rules around play dates, around outside activities, around travel. Um, and so, you know, kind of keeping in mind those ground rules, your own comfort, um, kind of what is acceptable. And then, and then there's kind of, you know, your kids telling you, you know, <laughs> these people are doing this and can I do that? Whether that's, you know, the something that's happening in person and having to figure out whether that's safe or, you know, of, of course, a lot has moved um, online. And then that kind of parents are, again, in the position of having to manage, um, you know, the social media engagement, which, you know, families do um you know, really differently, and I think is really challenging at this age. I mean, I think, you know, probably, you know, I think, I think one of the important things to keep in mind is to, um, to, to keep a similar kind of 
structure and set of parameters that you may have had um, before. And I would think about that um, in terms of in terms of social media. Like on the one hand, that's a that's often a way that um, you know kids you know, kids want to go to more to stay connected. On the other hand, you know, there are, um, you know, there's, there are the same issues, you know, that, that have always been there. So I think without, um, that, you know, thinking about really how, how you, how these things were managed, um, how you were setting these parameters before, because that's really, you know, I think in this age group, it's all about kind of, setting the parameters that you feel comfortable with and then um and then you know negotiating it um with your kids and you know it it's, comes out differently with different kids um and in, in different families to book to bookmark that just a little bit um would you say that asking you know my middle school experience isn't obviously the same as my son's but is it is it bad for parents to um, knock on the door and, and, and promote, or is that only causing more anxiety for them to be like, who did you talk to in school today? Did you meet anybody? What do you want to go walk to Starbucks with somebody? Did you meet somebody new? Does, does that just cause more anxiety for them? Or sh and should we just wait and see if they ask the question or open the door to have that conversation? Does that, do you understand the question? Yeah, I think it can. I mean, I think, you know, and it, and it depends on what kind of kid you have, right? Some kids are, I mean, I think, you know, I think all kids are, are anxious and really kind of caught up with social dynamics in middle school, but whether they're, you know, but I think what that looks like is very different, whether they're the kid who's like, you know, worried if people are going to like them, worried if they're going to be accepted or whether they're, you know, the ones who are kind of, <laughs> cre you know, creating the social plans and kind of, um, you know, the, the issue is more that like they're out there and they're, they know what they want to be doing. And the tension is like with the, you know, between the kids and the parents in terms of like the parents setting a limit. Um, and obviously, you know, those are sort of extreme examples and there's a lot that goes on in between. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think, you know, if your kid is, is anxious about, you know, about making friends, um, right. You don't want to, you don't want to be on top of them all the time, sort of with that same anxiety, right? Like they're anxious about it and then you're anxious about it too. Um, so I, you know, I, I, in that scenario, I tend to wait for, for them to come, um, to come to you and, and talk about it. Um, but, uh, but at the same time, if you're concerned that your you know, kids are, um, you know, get, get involved in social media in a way that's, you know, you think is excessive or you think is having a negative impact on them, you know, not being afraid to, to set ground rules, I think is important. Thank you. Okay. Oh, am I next, Kevin? <laughs> Do you no, I, it, it's me. <laughs> This question comes from Hillcrest Elementary School. We have 11 elementary schools uh, that go from pre-K through sixth grade in our school district. Um, this is a common one that I do hear a lot from our families. How should we address kids' fears and trepidation when reintegrating our children back into social situations when we've been so isolated? Um, I hear this, you know, in the immediate right now as sports start to open back up, very limited, but I think there are a lot of questions when things eventually do uh, open up how do we address kids' fears? Because for so long, um, they've been isolated. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think, you know, I think preparing them and I think having having conversations um, about it, um, you know, beforehand, just to, to let them kind of chew on it. Um, and, you know, depend, depending on the kids, I mean, some kids, you know, are just are sort of chomping at the bit, right, to be doing more. And, and some, you know, I think may feel like, you know, what is okay. And, you know, and I think this relates um, to, you know, this sort of larger question of, um, you know, of, of managing anxiety, like, what do we we're living in this, um, in, in this 
world where there is, you know, there's, there is this danger around us. Right. And so what, um, how do we manage that? And what, what message do we, do we send to our kids? And so I think, yes, you want to, you want to teach your kids how to do things in a safe way and sort of what the ground rules are. Um, but not necessarily that they have to, um, to worry about it. And so I think the same thing goes as things start to open up. Um, you know, there's, you know, there's an age appropriate way of talking about it that may have more or less detail um, in terms of why are things opening up? What is better? You know, kind of letting kids know enough um, about, you know, the, the, the infection rates have gone down. There's a vaccine so people can protect themselves. So, you know, whatever, whatever narrative you want to kind of give them. So they have some understanding of why this is happening. Um, and so now, you know, the, um, you know, the experts are saying that, that, that it's safe for us to do X, Y, and Z. Um, and I think, and so I think it's because it, I think what what the kids actually will what what they'll respond to isn't just um, the information, but is how it's delivered. And I think if we can be kind of calm and even and kind of matter of fact with it in our delivery, then it doesn't have to be um, so anxiety provoking. Um, you know, it's a bit like. Um, you know, you teach your kids to wear a helmet when they ride a bike, not because they don't wear a helmet because bike riding is a terrifying activity, but they wear a helmet so they can do it safely. And, you know, the same thing goes for, you know, the kinds of precautions we're taking right now, like wearing a mask. You don't, wearing a mask doesn't mean you have to be terrified to go out. It means that you can do it safely. So I think it's just kind of being, um, giving age appropriate information and just kind of being matter of fact that, this is, this is sort of the update and showing them that, you know, you're, you're calm and you're, you're managing it. And I think they will, they will go along. This next question kind of dovetails that. And, and I've experienced it a little bit um, with my own children, you know, about being in school, then being out of school and then being yeah. in school. So this, this follow-up question, how can my children feel rooted during the times of COVID-19 when the changing needs and requirements of society continually put their understanding in permanent flux. And, and I think we've all experienced that, particularly with, with, with schools. At one point, people said they weren't safe. Now they are safe. Um, how do you deal with that when, when you may have a black and white kiddo who you know says, well, wait a second, three months ago, you told me this wasn't safe, and now all of a sudden it's safe? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think it's really, it's, it, it right, it, it does go back to what we were talking about with the last question, where um, what you want to address is their, their anxiety, right? And, and by talking to them about it in a calm way, what they're, what, you know, what kids really look to their parents to do is to, you know, help them contain things emotionally. And so when you are sh- demonstrating that you can talk about this thing, and even, even without with limited information, you know, we, 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 we thought that this was the right thing. It turns out this is a better thing. Um, but what they're picking up on really is your, your affect, your tone, your body language, your facial expression. Um, and, and that's, that's giving them information um, to know, you know, whether they can feel safe. Um, this is- you're Go ahead, Karen. This, this question came in from uh, St. Mary's. Um, I feel like our children are all going to be germaphobic after living through this. Do you have any suggestions? That kind of piggybacks off of what Kevin was asking, yeah. but um, the, the hand washing and all those things, and then just being like in the beginning of the pandemic with you can't go here, you can't do this. How, how can we reintroduce them and, and not have them be worried about the germs? Right. So I think, again, it's your, it's sort of your attitude, um, towards it. Like, this is just a thing that we do, um, to keep ourselves safe, which in the beginning was hard, right? Because everyone was really scared because this is a really scary thing. So it's not, um, it's not that you have to be perfect and have zero anxiety, but 
to, to just remember, just like check in with yourself and be like, Oh man, you know, I'm, um, I'm, I'm really anxious about this right now. And, and, you know, and recognize it and find, um, you know, and find, um, find outlets for it. Um, I mean, I noticed this, um, with, uh, with my son, um, very early, I'll, I'll share this, this little anecdote. So, um, my son, you know, last March, he was not, not yet five. And, um, you know, as, you know, we're learning about the coronavirus, it's clear that it's, you know, you know, we're sort of learning increasingly how, how, um, you know, the extent of things, things are starting to shut down. And so, you know, I have to tell him something, I have to tell him, why are we not going to school? Why are we not going to see our friends? And um, initially I was calling, I wasn't calling it the coronavirus. I was calling it a big cold and, you know, we're, we're, you know, staying at home so that we don't share germs with people because, um, you know, the coronavirus doesn't have legs. So if we stay in our house, you know, it, it can't get from one person to another. It can only get from one person to another if we're close to each other and we're trying not to get sick. So I had this whole little (laughs) story I came up with and, and, um, and then he, he, uh, at one point, uh, sort of, as we've been, after we've been talking about it for a few days, sort of like looked at me and smiled and he said, you know, mommy, I'm the coronavirus, except I have legs. And I, you know, went to, uh, you know, my friend Jack's house and I got him sick. And I'm like, as a child psychiatrist, I was like, so happy to hear this story. Cause I'm thinking, oh, you know, he's working on this. He's playing with it. Um, you know, like with like kids play with bad guys or monsters or, you know, this is something that's scary, but he's trying to figure out like what to do with it. So I was like, so pleased about this. And then um, very end of March, we heard from, uh, you know, uh, family friends of ours, you know, their son is is good friends with with my son. And uh, I remember this on a Friday night, got a call from his from the wife that the the husband was um, intubated, admitted to the ICU. And, um, and that weekend, like just, you know, the, the tone, everything changed in our house. My husband and I were really, you know, on, on edge, like, you know, our whole feelings about the pandemic really shifted. Um, And, uh, you know, we just, we felt unsafe, right? And, you know, I think I was leaving the radio on more when the kids were around. I just, I mean, I was, I was distracted and I was really, you know, unsettled. And, um, and then that the next night, my son is like in bed, falling asleep. He's half asleep and he, he's, he's talking to himself and he says, there was a boy in England who got the coronavirus and died. And I thought, wow. So our narrative around the coronavirus has really changed. And like, I have to, I have to, you know, he's obviously picking up on what we're feeling and I have to um, kind of recognize that and and get that in check. So, I mean, I think, and you know, he didn't, he didn't like say anything specifically about it or about how he was anxious, but it was just so clear, you know, that he picked up on the tone of this. Um, and so, you know, I, that's just, you know, a long, <laughs> long way of saying that, you know, kids are, or kids are observing us, they're noticing, you know, our tone, our, our anxiety, how we're, how we're feeling. And so, you know, I think um, we're not going to do it perfectly, but as much as we can, you know, check in with ourselves and how we're, um, how we're feeling and, you know, give yourself that, permission, right? The time that you need to um, check in with the people that help you feel calm, feel connected, feel safe, you know, your partner, your friends, your, your family. um, And, you know, really doing that and, and doing that for yourself is important for your kids. The next question comes from, um, O'Neill, uh, which is the other middle school, but also this this parent um, is a fair amount elementary parent as well. Um, how do you deal with depression setting in with a middle school child? And then there's a follow up question here that also says, 
when they're in person because we have a, a system where they go one day and then the remote the next um, this parents indicating when they're in person they appear to be fine it's when they're disconnected at home where they really start to see some of those signs of depression so what are your thoughts on that yeah I mean I think I think this is happening I think you know a lot of kids um, are feeling you know less engaged less motivated um, when they're not um, when they're not around their peers. And so, um, you know, I think, um, and you know, and this is hard, right? Because um, this, the, you know, having kids do school at home and you're trying to work, like they, you know, they need more of you, right? And you don't necessarily have, um, have any more time, but I think, um, you know, finding ways to, um, to, um, create, create opportunities for, for fun, um, at home. And then also I think creating, um, you know, this goes back to one of the earlier questions about, about the social piece. Um, in some cases it may, you know, your kids may benefit from, um, help um you know finding ways to ways to connect with um their friends like on days when they're in school but in with the middle school or you know the nice thing is you can you can try to invite them into um a conversation about that like just noticing that um you know that they're that they're having a hard time either you know staying focused or they just um really seem unhappy um and sort of think think with them like whether there's some either a way to connect with other kids or something um fun that they'd like to be doing and just kind of acknowledging that you know that you know that it's hard that it's not ideal um and and that it's it's the reality and and trying to think of something that can make it um a little more pleasant for them even though you know you can't fix it completely i think one of the other uh themes we've seen in the questions tonight um whether we're talking about a kindergartner who hasn't been able to make those connections yet and establish their friend group mm -hmm. or with new people who may have just moved to downers grove and how do you, for, for kiddos who are new or aren't able to build those friend connections, how do you cope with that? And how do you really work with, with your children when all they're able to do is socialize with their members of their family? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I, I think it is really, um, you know, and this isn't, this is an issue for everybody, um, right? If people, families who have moved, um, you know, people who are looking for jobs and trying to network like this is sort of a time when everyone is kind of hunkering down and trying to, um, you know, just manage what's in front of them and people aren't looking to sort of expand their network and, and branch out. And so I think, um, for, for people in situations who need that, it's just, it's hard and it's not, um, you know, it's not ideal. I mean, I think, um, you know, I think with, with our kids, you know, and again, it's, um, sort of within the, the, the parameters of, um, of, you know, whatever sort of you're, you're doing for your family in terms of, um, any kind of, any kind of contacts. Um, but I, I think, you know, if they're, if they're able to, you know, identify kids that they want to connect with, um, then, I mean, I think, you know, trying to help support them in that. And, but I think also, you know, there's, you know, I think there's the anxiety about, um, you know, there, there's a common anxiety, right, among kids about missing out on things socially. And so I think that's always there. But the reality now is that there, there isn't really much going on, and there isn't much to miss out on. So to some extent, right, setting that aside and using it as, um, um, you know, using the time that the family has together to 
kind of discover things that that um, people like to do together. Like, does the family like to cook together? Is there a, you know, is there a game um, that everyone can enjoy? Like sort of taking it on as a challenge, um, you know, especially if you have kids with different ages and different interests, like what can we find that we all want to do together on a Saturday night and kind of trying to um, create that, that positive time. Because I think especially with, you know, kind of middle school age um kid i mean with all kids but i think as especially as they get older like that you know they're just missing that contact with their peers it's so um central for them and so you want to support it in whatever ways you can they want to have a facetime call with their friends those kind of things but um you also just want to build in like fun and positive activities in the family that, you know, help to some extent take the place of what they can't do with their friends in the same way right now. You, you touched on um, wh- how other families are, um, or with social media. One of the questions that came in was what advice do you have for talking to children who are jealous of activities their friends get to do? This is probably for an older age kid. Right. And, and when they're feeling left out, if a family has made a decision as a family that they're going to um, socially distance and not have any get togethers or, or interact with other people outside of their household. And they're sitting on uh, Instagram or Snapchat and see these three friends are down in the city walking around getting cupcakes. Like how do you, how do you deal with that with your kids when as a family, you know, you've made the decision together that that's how you're going to do it. But it still sucks when you see <laughs> your friend group doing something different. Do you have any suggestions for how to make that hurt less ouchy or stingy? Yeah, I think, um, you know, and this is something people face, right? Not just during COVID, but like, you know, families have different rules about, you know, what kids are allowed to do at different ages, who's, who can be on social media, Um, all kinds of things like that, you know, and kids know exactly what everyone else is allowed to do and are always comparing. And so, um, you know, I think parents know, you know, when they take an unpopular stance on something that, um, you know, they they have to be um, prepared for that, that pushback. Um, And so, you know, you, you pick your battles, right? And I think when you feel strongly about something, you just you're firm with the limit, you, you can be, you want to be empathic, I think, to a point and say, I get it, you know, I get that you want to be doing this. And, um, you know, I'm just doing, I'm, I'm doing what, I, what I think is best, but, you know, other people's parents do things different ways. And so, um, you know, I think different, you know, depending on whether, um, you know, kids are, sad or feeling left out or, you know, they're angry and you have to manage their anger. I mean, it's different things that come up, but I think that's just, you know, that's, that's the reality of what, what parents face when they set limits, you know, it's not, um, it's not fun, but um, I think, you know, as you're typically, you know, as there's this kind of, um, you know, initially when, when something is new, kids really try to push back in the hopes that they're going to get it changed. Right. But then (laughs) as it's just sort of consistently applied, typically, um, you know, they get used to it and they, they back down. So I think that, you know, when you feel strongly and you make a decision and, um, you know, you, you stick with your guns and you stick through that initial period, um, you know, kids will, kids usually will eventually move on. A lot of other, uh, you know, as we pull up themes for this, what indicators would help a parent to seek professional help uh, for a child's mental health? I, I, there's a, many parents who are wondering, is this typical or should I go see or seek help for this? Um, what are some indicators as a therapist that parents should be looking out for where maybe it's beyond what they can handle at home? Yeah. So, I mean, I think, um, you know, what we, what we think about typically are, you know, work, which for kids is school, 
and um, relationships. And so if, you know, you're, um, I think what's, what's sort of typical, you know, is um, kids being a bit more anxious, but you're able to reassure them. Um, kids may be a little less motivated and may need a little bit more support, a little bit more encouragement, you know, to get through their schoolwork. Um, and they may be sad about not being able to be around their friends and they may be mad when parents set limits. I think all of that is expectable. Um, I think <coughs> when um, parents should be more concerned is um, when there's been a, a really dramatic decline in how a child's doing academically. Um, they were a great student before and now they're, they're really disengaged. They're not doing their work. Um, there's really been a, a significant shift there. Um, or, you know, they're really, um, or, or a really significant emotional shift. They're really consistently angry, really withdrawn, don't, don't seem to be able to enjoy themselves very much. Um, or, you know, if they're anxious, they're anxious to the point that it's like distracting. They can't focus on their schoolwork. They're, they're maybe having trouble getting to sleep. They're, you know, complaining that their head hurts or their stomach hurts um, sort of consistently. I mean, those are all things that um, to me would, would signal something's going on. Another question came in was, what is the single most impactful thing I can do or refrain from doing to support my kids? Like, is there something I shouldn't be doing anymore or um, something I should be doing? Yeah, so that's a great question. I mean, I think, um, you know, we're, we're talking about, um, about, self-care and I think really recognizing how you're doing and how things are impacting you, right? Because your kids, um, I mean, this is always true that, you know, kids are, are you know, even, even when they're ignoring you and they don't listen to a thing you tell them, they're paying attention to you and they're taking in, um, you know, your, how you're feeling about something, right? And so, um, you know, I think, um, really um, kind of recognizing that. And, and I think also um, feeling, you know, I think it's a time, you know, when people feel so powerless, but I think really feeling empowered as parents to do what feels safest and most comfortable to you, because that um, that is going to help you be less anxious and you being less anxious is going to help your kids be less anxious. Great. Another one that came in, I had it, my bad eyes. Um, how can parents help young children understand why they need to follow COVID safety rules like uh, no hugging friends or stuff like that? Telling a five-year-old you can't go run to your friend and hug them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, what's, what's crazy, right. Is how quickly, um, kids I think have, have kind of gotten used to these, these rules, these sort of new normal, um, you know, I, I, I um, I, I tend to, you know, to just want to give, um, give kids very kind of, factual information that's not too much it's not going to overwhelm them but um that sort of helps it make sense for them like you know five-year-old four or five-year-olds you know talking about like they know about getting sick and um so you know i talk about it like that i told you i told you the, <laughs> the little story about the coronavirus and the coronavirus doesn't have legs and you know you can you can sort of tell them, tell them a little story and they, you know, and they will, um, and, and, you know, I think young kids especially will really hold on, um, to those kinds of, um, 
to, to, to those stories. And, and especially around that age, they're, um, you know, they, they're really interested, they're starting to get interested in rules and, and what their rules are. And so if just, just sort of explaining, you know, quite um, simply and matter of factly, you know, we're, we're trying not to share germs so we don't get sick. That's more or less what I, um, what I tell my kids. And, um, you know, and I, and I think that, you know, they don't, they don't do it perfectly, but I remember I was so, I was like, kind of, um, blown, I've been kind of, I was kind of blown away by like how, how quickly, like, I think it was within a couple weeks, you know, when we, um, would over the summer, you know, would sometimes see people outside, um, like how, how few times I had to remind my son to not touch his friends and to, you know, keep, um, distance from them. It really, um, you know, I, I think that they, um, they're, they're used to being told rules that they don't quite understand, but they get that they have to follow. And so I think a little story and then, uh, you know, you can do this and you can't do that. Um, and, and I think young kids do pretty well with that. One of the most common questions that I get as the superintendent is there's a lot of anxiety from parents and, and much of it is justifiable about kids falling behind in school and worrying long term about what that may mean for their future. Um, even though our district has been one of the districts that has been open more, uh, the reality is we haven't been able to, because of all the health guidelines, be open like we would in a normal year. So again, there's a great deal of fear that children are falling behind and it's causing a lot of stress that, um, you know, can then be placed on, on the child. So how do you help parents like all of us who, um, you know, now we're in almost a year of this and things still aren't back to normal. How do you help deal with the future question? Um, I, you know, I think as much as possible, just try to, um, you know, I think re refocus, help people refocus on um, the social and emotional piece, because I think that if children are um, still enjoying learning and, um, you know, engaged in school and engaged with their family and um, doing doing as well as they can socially and emotionally that that's, I mean, that's, I think how we set them up to be able to go back into the classroom and, you know, absorb whatever, you know, pieces of material that they didn't, um, you know, that they didn't get completely because I think that part, um, I mean, that, that they, they, they will, um, they will make that up. I mean, to some extent, you know, this whole cohort of, of students has been impacted, you know, by this. And I'm, you know, I can only imagine that for generations, we will be trying to understand um, that impact. But I think that in terms of, um, you know, preparing them to return to something more like normal life, in the future and to be able to be successful that um, really helping them, you know, to find joy, to feel comfortable, to feel relaxed um, in their lives right now is, is the most important thing that parents can do for them. Um, another question that's come in, uh, and this is more broad stroke, but could you address tools or ideas, tips to assist with the parent-child relationship? Uh, obviously, with everyone under one roof, um, whether they're hybrid or remote, um, there's added stressors in all households. But what might have once been a really great parent-child relationship may be taxed right now. And do you have any tips for how to rebuild or repair a parent-child relationship during this time? 
Yeah. So, I mean, I think this is, this is one of the things that's really tough, right? Like, um, you know, some people, some people do homeschool their children, but most of us um, send our children to school and, and, um, and a big, you know, important function of that is that it, um, it, there are many functions of it, but it hugely unburdens, um, you know, the parent child, um, relationship from, um, you know, the responsibility for sort of teaching and, and correcting. And I mean, cause parents are doing that, you know, anyway, I mean, that's part of what we do as parents, we're teaching our children, we're, um, we're, we're correcting them. But I think, um, you know, with, with your parent as your primary academic teacher or coach or any of those things, it, it's, it puts a burden, um, on the relationship. Right. And so, um, you know, I think, I think it's, it's really important to notice that and to not just feel like, why is my kid so mad at me all the time? But I think that parent I'm sure is very right that, that, that this, you know, this setup is, um, significantly burdening the relationship. And so, um, you know, I think, it, you know, if there are particular subjects in school that like, you know, you were a math major and your kid is struggling in math and like you butt heads every time you try to help them with their math, recognizing that, seeing if, you know, is there somebody else, oh, maybe even virtually who can, um, you know, another family member or, you know, an uncle they like or whoever, like sort of notice what the biggest pain points are and, and see if there's a way to address that. Um, and I think the other thing is, um, as much as you can finding, um, finding ways to spend positive time together where you're not teaching, you're not, um, instructing, like you're doing something together that the child likes, that's fun where the parent doesn't have to be teaching or in any kind of, um, evaluative or, or critical role. Nah, Maggie, <laughs> don't be a mag. <laughs> Uh, like my house. Yeah, like build Legos with your kid and you you have no idea how to do it and they're the Lego, you know, champion and just admire how they do it or, you know, something that that is that is fun and that, you know, your kid enjoys and where that's not gonna be um where that where you can get out of that dynamic with them basically. Yeah. Take yeah. the edge off. Okay. Just to to piggyback off of that, we did get a question that came in that talked about, you know, when you're all home in the same house, um, how do you go about building those positive relationships? I, you know, I could speak for probably many parents on this call where if I left my kids to their own, you know, wishes, they would be on their devices and, and, you know, more screen time, which is the opposite of what we want during this time. So how can you go about building those positive habits? You talked about, you know, discovering your child's interest, anything more on that? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, right, how do you, how do you lure your kids into spending time with you, right? When, when they're little, all they want is to spend time with you. And then as they get older, right, <laughs> they're off in their rooms on their devices. And so how do you bring them back? And I mean, I think, um, you know, it, what, what, it's like, what do they, what do they want to do? Like, think of the thing that your kid, your kid would be willing to do, even if they had to do it with you, right? Like <laughs> finding things and, you know, multiple kids in the family, like making it, um, you know, okay, so Friday night is the time we're going to spend together. And, you know, so-and-so got to choose last week and so-and-so is going to get to choose this week. And, you know, making it, making kind of a, a routine or a ritual around um, some time that is is a little sacred for the family, where um, you know there's a there's kind of a routine around um, who picks what you do, and everyone is available to participate. And you can't do it every night because then you know it just becomes a burden. But I think finding some time for that. Um, is really important and that's you know it's something we can do during this time. Tracy you're muted. I'm reading um, this question came in from Henry Puffer 
um, elementary. My kids already had an attachment to me pre-COVID. How can I prepare? How can I prepare them to go back to school after being by my side for a year? <laughs> Weaning them. Exactly. The opposite problem, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's always one or the other, right? Yeah. Want to be with us the perfect amount. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think um, that's a great question. And families are in different situations in terms of whether they're hybrid or remote, but I think recognizing that 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 transition is going to be a challenge for your child and you know um finding ways to sort of introduce to to do it in steps like um if if they're going to be if the idea is that they're going to be back in school in the fall whatever you do with them over the summer that feels safe and comfortable to you that somehow builds in some structure that doesn't involve them being with you 24 hours a day because i think that's right if you don't want them to go from with you 24 hours a day to you know away from you seven hours a day it as the parents anticipating it's not it's that's not going to go well so i would say follow follow that instinct and um you know, grab, find things that they want to do that they're, you know, excited about. Maybe there's an outdoor activity over the summer that you feel is safe, something they want to do. You sign them up that, that kind of thing. I think anticipating that and, and exactly like this parent is suggesting the kid's going to need some help getting prepared. So I think that's right. Believe it or not, we're getting toward the last five minutes. And, and this is another thing that's come up, but, um, we had a parent who just put in our chat here. Um, what long-term social emotional effects do you feel the, the pandemic has had on uh, children? This is one that I often get as a superintendent and obviously this isn't in, in my background. Um, academics are one thing we can offer, you know, some uh, summer school and tutoring and those types of things. Um, but what about the social emotional long-term impacts? Um, and I know every kid is different, yeah. but in your field, what are you hearing? What are you discussing? What are some things that we can look toward as parents, you know, down the road here? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it's so different. Families have been impacted so differently. And so, um, you know, for, for some kids, they're just, they're, you know, sort of missing the structure of school and more time with friends. And, you know, some families have really been, been turned upside down by this and it's much more. Um, but, you know, I think that, um, you know, and, and I think to this last question too, I think as much as we can, you know, trying to um, create some sense of, of structure and of normalcy, because I think, you know, what, what we're seeing, um, you know, most often is issues that kids are having or they're feeling anxious or, you know, feeling bored, withdrawn, disengaged, and, um, and just kind of, um, you know, and I think this is a, this isn't just kids, this is sort of a broader phenomenon. I think with so many people sort of being remote and so many parts of life not happening, it's like, um, it's almost like we're hibernating, like we're kind of operating at this kind of lower level of energy. And I think we're going to have to prepare to some extent to, um, you know, to exert the amount of energy it takes to be out in the world every day um, in the way that that we were. And so, um, you know, so I think, you know, ways we can help our kids to to prepare for that is, you know, on the one hand, being, being flexible, like there, there are in many ways more restrictions than, than there were before. There's so many things kids can't do. Um, but also, you know, with more time at home, there's less structure. So, you know, without being rigid about it, having sort of flexible structure at home, having consistent expectations about, you know, clearing the table, cleaning your room, getting up, getting dressed, you know, these kinds of things to just keep a, keep a routine and keep kind of consistent expectations. Um, and I think that that sets kids up to, for it to be less of a shock um, to the system. 
um, when, you know, as things do open up more. Fantastic. I, I, we got, I, I went through all the ones that, all the questions that I had received. Yeah, believe um, it or not, we're, I think we're at the end. <laughs> the hour goes very quickly. Thank you so much, Dr. Levy, um, for joining us today. And thank you to the Ed Foundation um, for sponsoring tonight's, there she is, <laughs> Janet, uh, for sponsoring tonight's uh, webinar. Um, this will be posted uh, tomorrow. Before I forget, one thing I can do is um, I have a series of slides and my last slide has um, some resources on it that I can share my screen really quickly here. Um, if, if I can do that. Um, just have a couple of um, websites um, that I think have, have some really good information about kids and some resources um, if families are looking for some more help. Um, so I just go ahead and share this. Um, we see it. Great. Yeah, this is great. Thank you so much for sharing this. We'll have this on the um, Education Foundation Facebook page as well as the District 58 YouTube channel. Um, and then we'll send this uh, link as a follow-up to uh, everyone that's registered. Um, so I guess, uh, Tracy, I don't know if you want to close out, but we wanted to just say thank you because this is our first webinar with Dr. Levy. Um, I think on behalf of Kevin and Tracy too, we're just very grateful that we have a platform to talk about these types of things. And again, if uh, you have any topics that you'd like for us to cover, we'd love suggestions, send us an email. Um, but otherwise, thank you so much for being here tonight. It's, uh, it's wonderful to know that we can support the community this way. Thank you so much, Janet. Thank you so much to the Ed Foundation of District 58 and Dr. Levy. It, it was a pleasure. Um, and uh, lots, lots of different topics, lots of running themes, definitely. Um, so we, we just need to all start talking more and opening up and being willing to share. I think that's where you, you learn, learn what's happening in your house is probably happening in somebody else's house too. So there's comfort in that, I think. So uh, on behalf of all of us, thank you so much for joining us tonight. And um, thank you so much. Thank Cheers. You.